this is becoming a habit. Um, so being in this room and, and presenting some uh, fantastic uh, films and documentary work. Now tonight we are in, you are in, I have already had a treat because I've seen this before. I've seen it developing in fact. I feel that I, I, I feel um, I, I feel that I, I really saw this this particular documentary developing from its infancy to now. But no, you're in for a treat, and you're in for a double treat. Uh, we're going to see a fantastic um, film, a fantastic documentary, which is uh, Old Liborki, uh, Beyond the Frame, Beyond the Border, sorry. In the frame. Beyond the Frame, I keep calling that. Yeah, Beyond, beyond the Frame. Beyond the Frame. Beyond the Frame. Beyond the frame. Uh, and then, after we've seen the documentary, we'll have a conversation with two of the people without whom that documentary wouldn't exist. Uh, Simone Brioni, who wrote it, directed it, in this case, and was very much, um, from the beginning to the end, the mind behind it, but you've also seen it on the screen. And we have with us Cristina Uba, Cristina Alvaya, uh, one of the absolutely best uh, writers who uh, produced literature, poetry, novels, short stories, uh, theater in Italian today, uh, who's joining us. Uh, from Europe, because she's, she's an itinerant writer as well, and who will, um, who you also will see in the film. She is integral to this film, not only because she's on screen, because she, but because she's inter integral in the, into the multiple frames of this documentary. Now, this is a documentary that was very much born at Stony Brook, so it uh, benefited it from um, a FAS and also a CAS seed grant from the university. It also has subtitles done by our students, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, it was my students, Simone's students, who collectively you see all their names at the end. So stay for the titles. Don't go. A, because of the, just the, uh, the conversation afterwards, but B, because of all the names there. So it benefited from that, and, and from there, it has, uh, well, it's gone a long way. So it's been shown at um, documentary and film festivals from Croatia to Hungary to here in the USA and Italy, of course. In Italy, it opened at the Milan African, African Film Festival. Um, it has been awarded amongst the various prizes the Virginia Dares Festival Award and also the Midland Documentary uh, Award for um, San Alcona, um, Sara. Uh, film festival in Lisbon, Portugal. It is, I said, a historical documentary. It's a film about history, but it's also a film about the memory of that history. And it's a film about images. And you have that fantastic um, sentence there, that quote from Malta Mengiste, another phenomenal writer who was a guest here um, a couple of years ago. It was at our first event after COVID was in Malta. And that quotation from her is a very good incipit, very good start for the, um, for the film. No story is ever simple, and every photograph extends beyond the frame. You'll see how photography is indeed uh, very much the starting point um, of this documentary. But let me say a little bit here about that story that is never simple. Um, and I feel bad in a way saying this. I had Simone here, that Schimelis, they, they, and I had Uwa Christina. They could say this much better than me. Um, but why not? I'll say it. So, this is a film that is about the memory, the legacy, the history of Italian colonialism. Now, amongst the many, many colonialisms and the many infamies of colonialism, Italy doesn't often get remembered, but Italy did indeed have a part in that history. And it's a very unpleasant, a very um, traumatic history um, for the many countries, the, the, the countries that were involved in it. And um, Italy, soon after the unification of the country, so already at the end of the 19th century, was involved in an attempt to do what European countries did, uh, find colonies, build an empire. Um, they were defeated. That were defeated uh, by the Ethiopian army um, in the late 19th century. But then they started again, first in India and then under fascism. 
Somalia, Ethiopia, and Somalia has already been partially occupied. Eritrea what was called the first colony. There is a history of genocide. There is a history of using chemical weapons. There is a history of many, many traumatic acts, which Italy partly remembers and partly wants to forget. And I think that second part is much bigger than the first, actually. But to the people you have here, I'm looking at Ula Cristina, I'm looking at Simone, I'm looking at Chimeles, and to a little, to a certain extent, myself as well. We're part of those who want us to remember, um, because without remembering, well, we forget that no story can, is ever simple. We also forget that stories should not be repeated. Um, and I'll take a sentence from one of Uva um, Cristina's wonderful books. We also forget often that these histories hit everybody, and these histories involve everybody. There's an amazing um, sentence in one of Uva Cristina's latest novels, um, this one, Le Stazioni della Luna. Not yet in English, but I hope it will be very soon, because it's amazing. And we hear one of our um, female characters, the character protagonist, Edna, says, no fight, I, well, every fight without women is a nuclear fight, and no fight can be successful without women. So it's a history that you will see here, which involves everybody, it involves all kinds of um, members of the Italian history, and the uh, Somali history, of the Ethiopian history, of the Eritrean history, uh, the Libyan history. I don't want to say much more than that, but someone said, say something about Italian colonialism, and I've done that. I could go on for hours, but I will not go on for hours. Um, enjoy the film, enjoy the documentary. I'm sure you'll have questions afterwards, and having Simone and Uwe Cristina here, as I said, is the extra treat for tonight. Simone, over to you. Um, I'm sure you have questions. I would have plenty, but I can get them later. So if you do have questions at the end of this, you can always start. Yeah. Um, first of all, just thank you, both of you. Um, and uh, uh, thank you to Stony Brook for investing in this wonderful <laughs> project. Um, seldom do I feel that our funds are so well used. Uh, this was absolutely fabulous. Um, my question relates to the tone, um, because it, it was really striking to me that at the opening you set uh, a comical tone, um, the kind of the dancing, um, you know, the it it was very lighthearted, comical, and then it just kept going down, um, and by the end. I mean, it was, it was such a sense of tragedy. Um, and, and it's unusual for a film uh, not to kind of come round. I mean, to, to have that trajectory strikes me as unusual. Um, what was your thinking about that? Because I could imagine, I mean, it, the, there's no choice but to present the tragedy. But it seems you made a decision to exaggerate the comical uh, quality of the beginning. <clears throat> Can you tell me about that decision? Thank you so much, Susan, for this uh, question. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, film is really, uh, it really documents how we started the project. You know? So the process is really at the center of uh, uh, the, the making of the film. No? So it was like, a, you know, I studied colonialism for almost 10 years and I didn't know the story of colonialism of my family. So when I found that, it was like, come on, really? <laughs> and so, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, I was stuck with, it's a COVID movie because I was stuck in my village, I couldn't leave it. There was a, you know, the Lombardy was a, a, was a, a red zone, basically a constant red zone. Uh, and so that's why I went to see this relative of mine and actually asked him, you know, to, to fix my glasses and then, you know, I reconnected yeah. with all these Jews. I, I didn't know about all this, etc. Yeah. So 
I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, document that the music is also a 1908 music, you know, so it kind of brings us back to that period. Uh, and so this is how we started. I mean, we didn't know exactly what kind of, pro of product uh, we were actually making. We had a constant rewriting of uh, uh, the film uh, because of, uh, you know, many reasons. But I think, uh, you know, that uh, um, uh, perhaps the quality of many documentaries about colonialism is that, you know, you immediately start uh, looking at them and you immediately think that this is a historical film. No? Mm -hmm. This film is something else, you know, it's more a personal investigation and, uh, uh, you know, and, and so we wanted also to make it, you know, more engaging, interesting perhaps for, for audiences uh, who didn't uh, know uh, much about to enter into the story uh, without starting immediately with this kind of historical take. take. Of course, history is there, uh, but we want to take, uh, you know, to reason through some personal connections, you know, so uh, from my personal story and then in dialogue with, with, uh, with Uba. What do you want to say anything about your involvement in the film and, and how that fits in? So it was. Um, it, it has been very interesting the collaboration with uh, Simone because, as you were saying, it was uh, just after COVID, and uh, I was. Um, I had. I have just my 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 last novel just uh, was just published in Italy, and um, and uh, that novel was about the fifties. By, by the way, in a, in, it had it happened in a very in, in the shed. But um, I was stuck in South Africa during the COVID. We were all stuck somewhere. And um, it was very interesting for me, this process of writing this novel, because I, I was stuck in the 50s in Somalia, in Mogadishu, reading all these uh, newspapers, daily newspapers, um, uh, uh, which were called uh, Corriere della Somalia in Italian. And um, so, not really reading not many things about about what was happening in the world with COVID, but it's all the ordinary life that Italians were living in Mogadishu in those years. So when Simone you called me and you asked me this to 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 I mean to come and present the book and uh, looking at the images that we were that the documentary we were working on. It was a connection, immediate, immediate connection, because I was just, yeah, in, th in this period and this uh, story of memory and, uh, yeah. Can I ask you one more question? It's for both of you, because, um, so the, the film is made up, for me, the film is made up of, of, of two things, or it has two pre-texts, not pre text but pre-texts, what comes before, images, a whole set of images. The, the little box that so many Italian families have, I do not know they have, and so on. Uh, and I recognize that, you know, it, it's true in my family. But also reserved for both of you. And so I'm, I'm really interested in your process, and as you say, and, and Susan's question takes us there, the film is trying to really <coughs> take us through that process. But I'm really interested in your process, in your working process. How does research and, and image come into that, but also you say something so beautiful in that final conversation. I don't represent anything. I'm not representing anybody. So also there is this connection, what you were saying now, you know, there's this connection between personal experience and collective experience. Personal memory and collective memory. So how do you both negotiate that tension in your work? I ask easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, very complex uh, uh, question. So, um, where to start? So, um, I think this, uh, uh, well, this uh, uh, this film is the result also of uh, you know it's um, I mean I lost the thread of the question <laughs> while I was thinking it's, it's about that it. Negotiation and yeah. you know, images, research, the the hidden part, but is that negotiation between the, the personal mm -hmm. 
mm. memory and the collective memory. Yeah. The personal history, or personalized and family history, and the collective history. Yeah. How do you negotiate that? Yeah, to put it in a very simple way, um, you know, I started this and uh, you know, it was a family story, you know, something that I didn't know. And of course, uh, you know, I felt immediately you know, touched by these pictures because I had, I mean, I think the most difficult part of making this film was actually to resist the beauty of these pictures. They were incredibly beautiful and at the same time, they also were telling a story of violence, a story of exploitation, etc. So I had, you know, this very personal, I had to do something about them. And I was already, um, Kind of very, um, you know, Lisa was working also on another film, uh, and I think uh, the this film and the other film have a, a strong connection, a strong dialogue, because in the other film we investigate the reversal of the gaze. So the uh, how uh, you know a, a writer uh, Genevieve Macapin talks about uh, the reversal of the gaze, the black gaze, uh, looking back at Italians, uh, looking at her. In this case, we wanted to show the technology of violence, which is inscribed in the white site. Uh, and uh, uh, we wanted to show how that, uh, uh, you know, obviously I felt, uh, you know, uh, mm, personally um, kind of uh, uh, compelled to uh, somehow answer to the, uh, again, the beauty and the violence which was present in these, in these images. But at the same time, I thought that, uh, you know, the, the, the story, was not only my story, it was uh, you know, actually a shared, uh, a shared history. Uh, I actually uh, interviewed and talked to many people uh, in, uh, um, in Borgo Satollo who actually had uh, uh, family connections with the colonies, etc. It was very interesting for me to learn about their stories. I only put one of the stories here in the, in the film, the story of another with Giulio Brioni. But you know, in the cemetery of Borgo Satollo, uh, by entering, and I mean, I went to the cemetery many times, but there is one tomb which is kind of separated from the rest of the cemetery and celebrates one uh, Italian soldier who went and, and fought in Africa. No? So it's kind of, it was always there, but I never actually saw it. You know? <laughs> uh, I actually never knew about uh, the Libyan's neighborhood in my city. I did it by discovering it. You know? So uh, I didn't know the origin of uh, uh, Via Ambador. It just sounded like a weird name. And then I did some research. Uh, and uh, you know, Am of course is mountain um, in uh, 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 in America, and uh, it, it is their translation. So I learned all these stories about my city that I didn't know about. Uh, but then it seemed to me to be kind of limited, not only to talk about this story. You know? we needed to show the other uh, the other side of the story. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, Uva, I mean, it's uh, partly an autobiographical inspired film because I learned so much by reading uh, Uva's work uh, and, uh, you know, from her books uh, and uh, from the dialogue that we had in this, uh, you know, indirect or direct dialogue that we had in these uh, years. And so for me, uh, you know, talking about this autobiographical experience was also somehow to give back what I've learned uh, uh, thanks to, to Uva and her work and the work of other writers who actually have been able to show this uh, story from a different perspective. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kassim, for your question. I think that what I say, I don't represent anybody, I'm not, I'm, I'm not representing Yeah, I'm not here to represent, exactly. Yes, but, but the, the important thing for me is always about responsibility in history. I mean, as, as I was saying with him, I mean, there are historical responsibilities, but then also, if, if when we are, we can always choose our position. Um, we, we always have the possibility to take the right choice and to stay on the, on, on the other side in a way. And um, I saw about sources, when we were talking about sources, then I think that for me it was a, really a privilege because I worked for some years uh, at, a, at an Archivio Somali, Somalia, which, is, which was a very controversial place because um, there were, it was a collection of all documents um, taken by Mogadishu after the war, and um, there, were, there are not many archives left from Somalia because of the civil war in Mogadishu. So I had the, the, the chance to have access to all these documents, but also Somali, um, I mean, poems and the conversation 
uh, of old people that were recorded in those years. And so listening and having this, um, the possibility to understand Somali, I had the two versions of the story. I mean, the Somali part, uh, not only images, and uh, this everyday life that I repeat with yeah. these sources about the Corriere della Somalia were very interesting because there were also letters written by from Somalis that were somehow resisting to to the Italian to the Italian occupation. So there was this conversation going on, even though the journal was uh, the, I mean um, the newspaper was Italian. So this this kind of uh, um, possibility to see and understand the two positions in the in this kind of forced um, yes. And, and what you say is that, that the little, small, not little, small yes. everyday gestures can yes. be very much part of that resistance and that resilience as well, which sends me back to that, that sentence that I love so much in, in the Fortuna della Luna, that yes. no, no resistance without, without no fight without women yes. can ever be complete. I mean, it's, it, it, and, and, and so when you say this morning, this, these photographs tell the story mostly from a male gaze as well, not just from the gaze, but also from a male gaze. And so that was missing. Yeah. You must have more questions. I've kept them talking for a while. One here, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure this is a question so much as a comment, although it follows from the discourse we've just had. Um, I'm terribly struck by the end of it, in which you have the pictures of the obelisk, you learn what obelisks stand for, and then you get this voice saying, you won't let me in, you keep my obelisk for 70 years, well, I can't stay here. And that's a terribly powerful summary that lands the question of what to do about what you learned squarely with us about now what, um, but it comes without an image and it isn't personal anymore, right? We don't know who's speaking that, right? Um, and, and I just wondered if you could say something about that, that it's a very visual film, obviously, and yet what resonates at the end is there is no person speaking it, there is no image of the person speaking it, it's, it's just there as this is the conundrum I reached by the, the early part of the film. And, and I wonder how you feel about, about that. It's a film that at the end does something almost not filmic, you mean that quotation that, that Christina cites about the, the, the migrant saying, you, you yes, know, I want yes. to stay. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we wanted to, again, to maintain that kind of personal, uh, you know, touch. It is uh, our personal perspective on these, uh, on these, uh, uh, on these uh, photographs, and again, there is, uh, you know, what can be done. Uh, uh, it can, you know, perhaps we can we can look at history is much more complex uh, than it is. You know, when we consider migration, we cannot consider migration without considering this history of exploitation. When we look at these pictures, we cannot uh, see that there are people involved in it. We cannot consider the agency of the colonizers. Luba says. Uh, so I think uh, what we want to, to to give back is the kind of the the nuances you know, uh, of, uh, of looking at these, uh, of these pictures, you know, the complexity of the stories that are involved uh, there, and there are no clear, uh, you know, or, or uh, like, uh, you know, um, clear-cut uh, answers, etc. I think what it can give uh, is the complexity of uh, an experience, you know, and this is what we try to, uh, to recreate, you know. Which goes back to Maza's beautiful quote at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. 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 And also to look beyond the, the, the frame, you know, to yeah. see somehow the violence inscribed in photography, you know, and what actually appears in photographs is just a small section of this complexity, you know. So photography never represents reality, it frames reality. Uh, and so, uh, you know, our attempt is also to look what is left outside uh, from these stories, you know, which are often women, uh, stories of resistance, uh, etc. You know? um, more questions? Yes, I think. I'll give you a few seconds. Is that Park Han? Speriamo. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be without Park Han. 
I, I have another question um, for you, Rob. You were saying before about the telling of stories, and I sort of reading or rereading your work. Um, one of another ritual struck me, and and struck me so much with respect to what you say in this film, and it's the poem about your grandmother. Your Italian grandmother. And the ending of that poem is, um, which I opened up because it, it, I can't remember it by heart, is, is so beautiful, but it's also so relevant to what you're saying here. It says, Eppure non ho mai imparato a strappare ortiche, né a fritarle tutte fitte per un pasto. Forse perché non è questo che mi chiedono, nonna. And l'altra storia che si vede, la più remota. So I will not try to translate it in a, in a poetic way, but what it says, and it's talking to your Italian grandmother, is yet, you know, I never learned how to pick the nettles, how to chop them so finely, to mix them, to make pasta with them, you know, to make the, the, the fill of pasta with them. And maybe that's because what they asked me is the other story, the more distant one. And, and so that I hear in that, you know, the more remote looking to us, but also the more exotic, perhaps, you know. So it's this moment when you're almost saying, I'm being asked to interpret that role, to be that other side of the story. And it's a really beautiful moment there because there is this ambiguity of that. Yeah, I think that some, somehow is, is, is connected also uh, to the moment when I moved to Italy. I mean, for me, it was really a shock. I mean, being Somali and being Italian, for me, was something natural. I grew up in Mogadishu, and um, somehow, I think also that I was lucky enough. This is why I always insist about having an Italian mother and Somali father, because Somalia is, a, again, a very patriarchal society. So as the daughter as a Soma of a Somali father, I was Somali. And I, I didn't represent, I mean, the colonizer. And um, I was really in love with all the Somali culture. I, I was allowed to be part of the Somali family, even though I was studying in Italian. I mean, the, my formal education was in Italian. So these two things, being Somali, being Italian, was not something that was um, a contradiction in, in Italian with me. But I understood that it was very complicated to negotiate these two identities when I arrived in Italy, because it, were, it was the early uh, 90s when Italy started to become, uh, I mean, the, the five countries started to have more and more space, especially in the, in the regions where my mom and Simone is from as well. Sorry, and uh, yeah, in the Northeast and in, and in Lombardia. And so uh, people were asking me all the time, oh, why you speak Italian so well? So I had all the time, yes, all the time to, to, to retell the story. So I understood that there was this huge gap, uh, a lot of racism, and, um, and uh, yeah, and so this, this, that was the moment when I, I started um, thinking about the connection of the two countries because Otherwise, it to me was something very natural. Yes, and uh, yeah, that I didn't have to to claim uh, all the time. So yeah, so thank you so much for that. <laughs> for that well, point. it's a stunning. Again, we heard one of your fantastic poems in in the, in the film. This is another one that I I love very much. Yeah. I have a quick question, just you know, for both of you. Like, how first, how do you envision the film circulating? And then also, how would you dream that the film could circulate? <laughs> uh, specifically, you know, who is this for? Is this for, you know, Italians? Is this for, you know, uh, Somalis, Ethiopians, Eritreans, sea wolves? You know, um, <laughs> specifically, you know, thinking about the choices that you, the choice that you made to have subtitles, right, as opposed to overdubbing, right? You know, to keep the to, to use the uh, Italian language versus you know, thinking about all the different options that you could have used. So. I think, you know, 
the circulation of a film is not something that you could uh, decide. Even the, I mean, the shape of the film isn't something that, have, that, have, that we have designed. You know, like uh, Maka was pretty much written uh, at the beginning and then it was rewritten, etc. This film was kind of, you know, we kind of added uh, little parts, uh, we rewrote some parts, etc. We were able to intercept uh, Uba, who was, you know, she is in bed. <laughs> uh, and so, um, we didn't really, um, I think for sure, uh, this is a, a film that, you know, I, when I see the circulation, I always uh, see, you know, the students uh, as part of it. It is also uh, a film essay, so it's a way to kind of reach uh, uh, in a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the audience that I usually, you know, that I usually talk to, so universities, etc. I have indeed also prepared some uh, didactic activities that goes go with the documentary. Uh, but uh, it will it has circulated in uh, film festivals globally in Korea, in uh, Japan, in Hungary, in uh, uh, Croatia, etc. And uh, it circulated it went to three documentary film festivals in the US. So I don't know exactly what the circulation is going to be. Uh, it will be um, uh, released in you know uh, in um, in open access uh, by an Italian distributor uh, called OpenDDB, which makes mostly political movies. Um, we presented it uh, at a film festival about uh, economics uh, in Trento, uh, and uh, so I think that you know uh, I think you think about uh, the circulation of a film when you have uh, when you can make money out of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there is also a network of you know a grassroots network of uh, possible venues in which this film can be circulated, which uh, you know are unexpected. Also the. People who collaborated with this film, I mean, the composer of the music, Nurbak, I never met him in person, uh, is uh, an um, Egyptian composer who lives uh, in uh, is between London and Brussels, uh, and he's a friend of a friend. I showed him the work, he liked it, and so he decided to make uh, the music. So it's a pretty much transnational work. The, uh, the poster was made by my uh, my. Uh, sister-in-law, um, uh, 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 Jane, uh, and uh, she usually does uh, uh, Hollywood uh, uh, movies, uh, so posters for Hollywood movies. So I think it was really a drastic contribution and, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how, you know, where it will circulate. Uh, but you yeah. must though, say what, how it went down locally, because you have now shown it in oh, the, true. Lo the local community, so you should say something about that. Yeah, that's true. I think it was, I mean, uh, we presented it at Saturn Hall, and it was actually very interesting because uh, the Italian American, there was actually quite a huge Italian American community at the screening, and they didn't know much about uh, colonialism. So they were really interested in knowing more about uh, uh, that. Um, also. Sorry, I meant the local community there, but yes, here. <laughs> okay, I, yeah. I, meant, I, meant, I meant where it started. So ah, in it, ah, no, the, uh, and the, of course, I mean, it was, it was a great success. No, I think that was actually very interesting because, you know, like, you know, people I, you know, I, I grew up with, but they, you know, they are you know, mostly workers, uh, they didn't know about much about the story and they stayed there watching the film. No, and to see my friend Francesco Salvalai, with whom I played soccer, uh, you know, and uh, you know, didn't know anything about uh, the film, stayed there, was actually, you know, drinking an aperitif, you know, and he passed by and said, oh, do you want to watch the film? And he stayed there for 40 minutes. I think that's the greatest success uh, uh, of uh, this movie. So locally it went, you know, also people who didn't know much about it, you know, they, they watched it, they were interested in it. It was presented in movie theaters in Italy as well, which was also another great, uh, you know, uh, success. So, you know, the, our point, you know, for our collaboration is that, uh, you know, living abroad, uh, it's always so difficult for us, uh, you know, for all of us to actually go back to Italy and have, uh, you know, Italian audiences look at what we do and the things that perhaps are produced uh, for us. And so it was very important also for for you, uh, Uba, to, to, you know, to, to collaborate in this project. Yes, it's very interesting living abroad and then especially writing because the language is always Italian so even though like, I'm in Brussels writing in Italian and I think that it somehow living abroad um, allows me to have a, a distance uh, uh, to, to not be involved in all the policies 
uh, surrounding uh, literature, surrounding world, these discussions about the uh, uh, post-colonial story. And um, yes, it, it, it gives me some freedom. Sometimes it's not easy because um, I'm not into the, um, I, 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 I lost, I, I lose many, many discussions going on. But at the same time, I, I think that I have, I have a kind of distance, I mean, especially, yeah. And about the audience, I think that the biggest success is when you are really able, you succeed in having, in making a, a local and very particular story universal so that everybody can, can relate to it and to read it, even, you know, th th this is the thing that is the yeah, most that, powerful. Yeah, the, the, the um, micro or mega thing. Yes. But also, I'm smiling because the other day in my class, yes. and, uh, and on that note, I will say to my students that if you need to go, of course, you, you can go at any point, don't worry. But we were talking about the British, I discovered British, not American expression, um, not seeing the wood for the trees. Yes. So that idea of the distance, you know, the distance that allows you to see the bigger picture, yes. we were discussing that. So, um, yeah. Hi. I have a question for both of you because you guys have two different perspectives, completely different in certain ways. During that time of the period of colonialism, I found out about this because, so this is gonna be weird, but okay. My grandpa was pretty much a baby that was born during the end of World War II, so he was surrounded by, he was between the fascists and uh, the communists during that time. And there was a song that I was curious about it. He used to sing it out a lot, but he didn't really know. He knew later what it was about which was about the colonialism. That song was pretty much speaking about colonialism from the Italian to the Somalian, Ethiopian. I don't know if you guys know about it. I'm sure they do, yeah, but we're not gonna sing it. Yeah, that, that's why I was like, I, yeah. Pretty much I was like, I don't know if you guys knew or were aware, like how do you guys react about it? Like, from the, yeah. Uh, yeah. More, more than one, I would say. It's yeah, so also where they were, they were really key in kind of, uh, you know, in uh, promoting uh, the, uh, like, photographs, you know, in promoting this uh, fascist, uh, the, the colonial enterprise. Uh, they were easy to remember. Uh, they, you know, somehow they, they somehow tune down what the actions that were, they were saying. And if you think about, uh, uh, you know, the song that you were mentioning is actually a celebration of rape, basically. No? Yeah. because it says, you know, go to Africa, there are these beautiful, uh, you know, uh, available uh, African women, uh, etc. And for the documentary, something that actually, um, you know, uh, we discussed a lot, uh, um, was, uh, uh, you know, in the, we use almost all the photographs of the, this distant relative, but there was a postcard of this uh, woman, uh, like, uh, you know, half naked, uh, um, looking, and there were you know plenty of these kind of uh, photographs. Now, one of the uh, ways to uh, uh, convince soldiers to go to Eastern Africa was precisely to say, well, uh, to you know, to feminize, to provide this. Uh, uh, um, basically, this pornographic material was really uh, pivotal uh, to the colonial enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we discussed whether to talk about. Uh, it or to show it uh, uh, in the film, and uh, you know we had to make uh, a decision about that, and in the end uh, we decided uh, not to use it. Yeah. Other films uh, uh, use it or discuss it, uh, but we didn't want to reproduce uh, that kind of imaginary, which is still so popular, not in, in in Italy. Yeah, yeah, it's popular, but the discussion about showing the material to and perpetrating so this yeah. violence. It's very, I mean, it's something very that we, we, we always discuss. And I remember also, we did discover uh, that when they, I mean, the editor, today we have a discussion about, about covers and um, my, my publisher, uh, they decided to, to put, because one of the main characters is, uh, she's born in, in, the, in the countryside of, no, in, in the countryside of uh, Somalia, and, uh, but she's an um, astronomer. In a way, she's a, um, I mean, for me, she's a, I mean, she, she's an illiterate, but she's an intellectual because 
She can read the stars. She knows how to move. She knows many things, and uh, this is why also why she is an intellectual and can join the, the, the fights for the liberation of the country. But then, when um, I, I I discussed a lot with the friends of mine about the the image, and my a friend a friend of mine told me, oh, but the only thing that you can be sure of is the source. Uh, you have to see, even though. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a normal image, there is no pornography here. She said, you, you, you have to see when the, the picture was taken. And so we investigated and uh, we found that it was a drawing, by the way, before the colonization, and it was a, an ethnologist that had done this. So somehow it was not related with the, it was anyway related, yeah, because ethnographers were the first ones, but. Uh, it was not a picture taken um, by during these these periods of uh, occupation in a way. So okay. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or any more comments? In that case, I think we can thank you again. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and yes, um, so. We keep saying that that particular book by Ulla Christina is not translated, but others are. So um, we definitely recommend them. Um, I don't know where the, the copy of Commander of the River has ended up, but there is. Um, remind me of the, 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 the yeah, Little Mother. Yes, it's the bean translation. So you can you have access to in English to Little Mother, who was uh, who was the uh, the first full length novel uh, by Ulla Christina and was translated a few years ago now, and then more recently, Commander of the River, um, which is, again, is, is a, another stunning narrative that takes you across Europe and in, in various directions. Um, and I really sincerely hope that Mutazione della Luna will be translated, so it's amazing, yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.